rocket. We're targeting our first afternoon at Starship liftoff just 34 minutes from now, and uh, and that will occur at 4 p.m. Central Time. Now, this timing will bring us daylight views of the ships flashing down on the other side of the world. I'm Kate Tice, Senior Quality Systems Engineering Manager here at SpaceX. And I'm Jesse Anderson, a Senior Structures Engineering Manager, and we are joining you live from SpaceX Hawthorne. On Flight 5, we promised you maximum excitement and Starship delivered in what had to be one of the most memorable moments in my time here at SpaceX. Same. <laughs> <laughs> like so many of you, we were in utter shock as we watched that historic booster catch unfold, and we're back today to try and do it all over again. As Kate mentioned, it's been just over a month since Flight 5, making this our quickest turnaround yet between Starship flight tests. Our ultimate goal is to get that turnaround time down to hours. Following Flight 5, the SpaceX team went to work, immediately implementing lessons learned into the vehicle and tower's hardware and software systems for Flight 6. This is what rapid iteration looks like. We gather real data from these test flights and turn around and fly again as soon as possible. This is the process that is bringing us the rapidly reusable Starship that will soon be taking us to the Moon and Mars. Flight 5 proved that we can safely bring the booster back to the launch tower, which is a key factor in driving rapid reusability, and land ship with a high precision splashdown in the Indian Ocean. We'll be taking you through today's test objectives in just a moment, but first, let's check in with Dan, who is on the ground just a few miles from the pad at Starbase with the best views. How's it going, Dan? Hey, Jesse, it's going fantastic. I got a couple hundred of my best friends out here ready to watch this launch and hopefully another catch today. Uh, but welcome everybody back to Starbase for another Starship launch. I'm Dan Hewitt, got Launch Control Center right behind me, tower just about six miles over that shoulder. It has been a pretty quiet countdown. Uh, not a lot of chatter on the loops right now as we are into prop load and we are counting down to the very top of our window at 4 p.m. Central Time, uh, so just about 32 minutes from now. Uh, right now, the range is projected to be clear by then. We've got our assets out there making sure land, air, sea, everything around the launch pad and then our flight path are clear before we give the final go to lift off today. Uh, we got through the weather pole. Everything was looking great. A little breezy today, but well within our constraints uh, for both launch and catch criteria. And as you can tell, we're loading propellant on board the vehicle. You can see those white frost lines starting to tick up as we're putting the cryogenic, uh, the liquid methane, and liquid oxygen out to both of those vehicles. Uh, the ship prop load started at about T minus 49 minutes, and then the booster followed just a couple minutes after at about T minus 41. Uh, we're almost halfway full on ship, just about a third on booster. Those are both going to continue until we're about three minutes, 20 seconds before liftoff on ship. And then the booster is going to close out at about two minutes and 50 seconds. So we pretty much are loading up right to that last possible minute, keeping it as dense and cold as possible, and then getting off the launch pad. Uh, the countdown startup sequence, everything will look very familiar if you watched Flight 5, assuming you did. Uh, but you're going to see the engines start to ignite at about three seconds before liftoff. They're going to start up in three different groups. First, those center 13, then 15 of that outer ring, and then those final five bringing all 33 Raptors online. Uh, after that, we'll see about a second later, and then it'll lift off, so a couple of seconds from first light until motion. Uh, as usual, we can hold at T minus 40 seconds if we have any last minute issues to clear, anything with the range, anything that triggers on the vehicle. And if we pass T minus 10 seconds, the deflector fires, and then we scrub, uh, then we're done for the day for at least 24 hours. But uh, weather is fantastic, light breeze, no clouds in the sky. Not tracking any hardware constraints to launch today. If we're not able to get off the pad, though, we've got opportunities throughout the week. Could be 24 to 48 hours later. But everything looking great. I'm excited to be able to see another one of these get off the pad. Check back in with everybody in just a couple of minutes. Back over to Jesse and Kate. Awesome. Thanks, Dan. Now, you could see those two towers in the back there in the distance at Starbase. Starbase is really coming along just as rapidly as Starship itself. That second launch tower will be coming online next year, and it will allow us to increase our flight cadence and test even more frequently. And just a few kilometers away from the two towers, our cutting edge one million square foot star factory is nearing completion with the goal of producing hundreds of ships a year. Yeah. That might sound crazy, and that's because it is. 
If you can imagine a future where we are flying and catching a fleet of boosters, which is the lower portion of the vehicle, that fleet is actually pretty small compa compared to the potentially hundreds of ships, the uppermost portion of Starship, that will be flying in that future vision. Yeah, exactly, Kate. Those ships will be staying in space for long duration missions to go to the moon or Mars or become tankers for refueling or any number of other uses. But the boosters will come back and turn around to launch the next ship. So in order to hit that production cadence of hundreds per year, we're rapidly building out Star Factory, which is our Starship production facility in Texas. And live views, not live views, views of that Star Factory there. Now, this place allows us to move system integration work earlier in the build process, which means more efficiency, higher quality, and ultimately, faster production. Starbase is an incredible place to be right now. There really is nowhere else in the world like it. You know, hint, hint, nudge, nudge. <laughs> <laughs> now what you might be hinting at is the good news is we are hiring. If you love what you're seeing, check out our openings at Starbase. On the engineering side, we're looking for vehicle design engineers across structures, propulsion, and integration. And if you're a hands-on tech, we're looking for integration technicians and welders that can help us hit our goal of building a Starship every eight hours. And to do that, we need builders. Yeah, we're definitely going to need a <laughs> lot of builders to get that down to just eight hours. Right. <laughs> now, beyond that, in order to keep Starbase growing, we have all kinds of roles, from baristas to HVAC technicians to EMTs. So chances are, if you're looking, we have a place for you. Visit SpaceX.com forward slash careers to see all of our openings. Every role is critical to the future of Starship. With Starbase growing faster than ever, we can't do it without you. This place is where our future is being built, and that is a future that we are all very excited about. All right, let's dive deeper into the inner workings of Starship and learn more about this flying skyscraper. <laughs> Starship features two major parts, the ship, which has six Raptor engines, and the Super Heavy Booster, which has 33 Raptor engines. Now, just like flights one through five, the current iteration of Starship is an experimental vehicle flying for development. And with a few planned upgrades, Starship will have three times the thrust of Saturn V at 10,000 metric tons of thrust, plus the added benefit of full reusability. Starship 2 will be capable of carrying more than 100 tons to orbit, and Starship 3 will be able to lift more than 200 tons to orbit. Now, the amount of mass we're able to launch per rocket is crucial to creating a self-sustaining city on Mars. Exactly. And speaking of launch mass, we should probably acknowledge the elephant, I mean, banana in the room, <laughs> and our today's secret payload. Okay, so two things here. The first is, remember on Flight 5, we had a giant Mechazilla decal where the banana is today. And there you could see that on your screen. Now, that decal is three feet tall which might be hard to tell looking at it on the ship right there, which is why we have a full-scale reproduction of that decal here with us so that you can see the size compared to humans. <laughs> yeah, um, it is bigger than you think it is. Uh, like Jesse said, it's three feet high. And this is full scale, just like the one that was on Flight 5. Now, it is hard to follow Mechazilla, but I do have one better. Bananas have been used for quick visual comparisons for quite some time, and our teammates thought it was time to bring the venerated yellow fruit to Starship. Today we're flying Starship's first ever physical payload, which is, as you might have guessed, is a, a banana. banana. <laughs> <laughs> That's a live view inside Starship, and if you look closely, you can see our stuffed banana payload, which is doubling as today's zero gravity or zero G indicator. And while this payload will remain inside the vehicle at all times and will not be deployed today, it did give us a chance to do a test run of payload approval processes with the FAA. And that's something that we're hoping to do next year if we start flying our first Starlink st satellites on Starship. Godspeed, banana. <laughs> Some additional size for context. A you can see on your screen a Starlink Mini next to a banana for scale. And to get an even better sense of how big Starship is, let's take the average size banana next to the average size human, which is about two meters high. Towering over our average human is the length of the Millennium Falcon, which comes in at 35 meters. 
Our Falcon 9 rocket with the payload fairing attached is double the size of the Millennium Falcon at 70 meters, and nearly twice the size of that is the fully integrated Starship at 121 meters tall. The ship is about 50 meters, and the Super Heavy booster alone stands 71 meters tall. And we do have plans to make the ship and booster even taller in the future. And yeah, it might be hard to imagine that because it's <laughs> pretty big already. Now, Starship's first stage has a diameter roughly two and a half times that of Falcon 9. And as you can see on your screen, with 33 much larger Raptor engines. I love this view. This is looking up at the aft end of Starship there at the engine bay. Now, moving up the rocket, the ship features six Raptor engines, three sea levels and three vacuum engines, which are optimized to operate in the vacuum of space. The ship is designed for vertical takeoff and landing on any hard surface, like the surface of the moon, for example. This ship is also outfitted with four flaps to help aerodynamically control the vehicle's attitude during atmospheric flight and enable a precision landing. To reach full reusability, the ship must survive re-entry not just once, but multiple times. It took the teams at SpaceX about three years to develop the heat shield on Starship, and development for improvements is still ongoing. The ship's heat shield is composed of thousands of hexagonal ceramic tiles designed to insulate the vehicle during atmospheric entry, where temperatures can be as high as 2,600 degrees Fahrenheit or over 1,400 degrees Celsius. The tiles are something we iterate on every flight test as we build towards a heat shield requiring no refurbishment between flights to unlock rapid reuse. And the teams have actually already begun testing the heat shield tiles in environments simulating Mars atmospheric entry conditions, which we'll see more of in just a few minutes. You know, slightly different than coming back to Earth. <laughs> Just slightly different. <laughs> and in between the first and second stages is our hot stage, which we saw in action on flights two, three, four, and five. So let's recap that last flight to understand what we accomplished and how that's changing for today's flight. On October 13th, Starship successfully lifted off at 7.25 a.m. Central Time from Starbase, Texas. A gorgeous sunrise ascent that was fairly quickly followed by the hot stage separation maneuver, which we see here, as well as on multiple previous Starship flights. Flights. The booster then performed a flip maneuver, boost back burn, and then we jettisoned that hot stage, which you see there. The booster then performed its, uh, its boost back burn, which brought it back on a trajectory to the launch tower, back to the Gulf Coast. We can see here it. We can see here the booster descending through the Earth's atmosphere. It broke the sound barrier again as it was coming back through. Those Raptor engines relit, and then the moment that made us all lose our minds, the booster came back for a successful first ever catch by the chopstick arms back at the exact same launch tower that it launched from. It was insane. As you can see, we all went bananas, <laughs> and you did too, probably. Thousands of distinct vehicle and pad criteria had to be met, and thanks to the tireless work of the entire Starship team, we succeeded on that first attempt. And while that all was happening, ship was continuing to coast towards the Indian Ocean. Uh, it executed a, an excellent coast, made its way down through re-entry, relit uh, its engines, did, a, did that flip maneuver, relit its engines for landing burn, and then splashed down into the Indian Ocean. Now that whole uh, flight test concluded that splash down one hour, five minutes, and 40 seconds after launch. Starship's fifth flight test was one of our most ambitious yet, and as we work to demonstrate techniques fundamental to Starship and Super Heavy's fully and rapidly reusable design. And I think I speak for all of us when I say that seeing the catch for the first time was an extraordinary moment for the entire SpaceX team. We've seen a lot of wild firsts here, but that was truly an epic moment in time. Yeah, uh, we're not forgetting that anytime soon. <laughs> Certainly one in the history books. Now, today's mission profile is very similar to Flight 5, but there are some differences that we've made, that we've incorporated as we prepare for future reuse. About 20 minutes from now, Super Heavy will ignite its 33 Raptor engines and lift off from Starbase. About two and a half minutes into flight, the booster will separate from the ship in a hot stage separation. And we've seen that occur on multiple flights, including flight two, three, four, and five. About two seconds after that burns, uh, will jettison that hot stage. Uh, the booster will perform its boost back, flip and boost back maneuver 
and we will once again look to return the booster to the launch site for a catch by the tower's chopstick arms. And once again, we will only attempt that if both the booster and tower are healthy after launch. We were successful last time, but we should emphasize that this process is still very new. And this is still just a test, so uh, success is very far from guaranteed today. It's always a possibility that we'll lose the vehicle. It's a contingency that we always plan for. Yeah, exactly. Now, while the booster is doing its job, the ship's six engines will remain lit for a few minutes before shutting down and then going into the coast phase. The ship will coast for a total of about 40 minutes or so, reaching a peak altitude of approximately 213 kilometers. <laughs> Now, one additional objective for this flight during coast is an in-space burn using one of ship's Raptor engines. Doing a burn while in space will build confidence that we can do deorbit burns, which is a key capability for upcoming orbital missions. Now, after the coast phase, the ship will attempt a controlled re-entry, and if ship makes it all the way down, will once again perform a flip and landing burn before splashing down in the Indian in the Indian Ocean. Yeah. Now, there are some notable changes to our entry plans for this flight, and they will intentionally push the ship to, and very likely, beyond its limits. This includes several thermal protection upgrades and operational changes as we prepare for future ship catch and reuse. Today's flight test will also test new secondary thermal protection materials, and entire sections of the heat shield uh, has actually been removed in certain areas. And on top of all of that, we're going to fly the ship at an aggressive angle of attack once it's moving slower than the speed of sound. Now this means we'll be flying nose down instead of our usual belly flop orientation during final descent. This will no doubt stress the limits of the flap's ability to maintain control, but it will be a chance to get real flight data on what our limits actually are. So to put it as bluntly as possible, do not be surprised if this is not a smooth flight to splash down today. We are intentionally looking for how far we can push and discover the vehicle's true limits as we plan for future ship return and catch. And even though ship recovery is not expected today, the telemetry and data we receive all the way to the end is what we're looking for and what will help us get to a rapidly reusable Starship of the future. Now, just like Flight 5, one of our objectives for Flight 6 is attempting to return the booster to the launch site to be caught by the tower. The booster for this flight has upgrades to add redundancy across its propulsion system, increase the structural, as well as increasing the structural strength in a few spots. We've also implemented a few changes across both ship and tower to try and speed up the post-catch timeline. Returning vehicles to the launch site leverages the same hardware that we use for stacking ahead of flight, making our infrastructure multi-purpose. And in order for us to achieve that rapid reusability that we keep talking about, we need a quick turnaround. And you can't get much faster than returning the launch vehicle right back there to where it needs to launch from again. <laughs> exactly. In this video, you can see our original render of Booster Catch alongside the actual footage of Catch from Flight 5. This video is just mind-blowing to see the predicted versus reality. And just like the last flight for today's Booster Catch, there are thousands of criteria that need to be met in order to proceed with Catch. Automated checks have to indicate we have a healthy booster and a healthy tower, and the flight director must issue a manual command, which is informed by manual checks from the flight control team. If this command is not sent prior to the completion of the boost back burn, or if automated health checks show unacceptable conditions with Super Heavy or the tower, the booster will default to a trajectory that takes it to a landing burn and soft splashdown in the Gulf of Mexico. I remember when we first heard the call out that tower was go for catch on flight five, and wow, I still get goosebumps when I think about that <laughs> moment. Now, for today's test, just like Flight 5, we're only going to catch if everything on the booster and the tower checks out after launch. As always, we accept no compromises when it comes to the safety of the public and our team. And so to that end, the area around the pad and the flight path are cleared in advance. A lot of things have to go right in order to line up the booster catch. So if all criteria is met, we will attempt to catch, but there is a chance that we may not. Either way, we'll be getting tons of in-flight data, which is extremely valuable. Exactly. That first catch was pretty epic, though. So like you, we'll be keeping our hopes high to see another one this afternoon. Now, Dan, you got to see it in person last time. <laughs> Are you mentally prepared for a possible round two? I, I mean, probably not. That was pretty hands down the coolest thing I've ever seen. And 
the fact that we're going to do that every time now breaks my brain a little bit, uh, but it was absolutely incredible. Uh, one of the unique aspects with Super Heavy coming back is it does generate a sonic boom. This is something commonly associated with reusable spacecraft. It's just, it's coming in faster than the speed of sound and then slowing down. It creates that pressure wave that builds up. And then when it reaches you on the ground, that rapid change in pressure is that quick thunderclap sound that you hear. Now, generally the only effect is that thunderclap, uh, that thunderclap sound, uh, but if you're not expecting it, it's definitely gonna get your attention and we were able to hear it last time. Um, the impact of, or how loud it is, changes pretty dramatically. And in this video, you can see as we were descending, and there was kind of that, that quick triple pop that you heard. Uh, now that was picked up from closer to the pad. Most people at our distance and further away, you're only gonna hear one or two as they're happening kind of so on top of each other that it might just sound like one big bang. Uh, but as I said, that's, that's something that's only associated with spacecraft being reused. We hear it with Falcon 9. We heard it during shuttle uh, and looking forward to hopefully hearing it today. Uh, just a quick status check, though. We're about 85% full on ship, uh, almost two-thirds of the way full on booster, continuing to count down about 13 and a half minutes, under, a little under that until we lift off today, uh, but still looking good. I'll check back in with you guys in a few minutes. Back over to Jesse and Kate. Thanks, Dan. Yeah, I, I think Dan said it really well when it really does hurt the brain to think that this is going to be the norm, that this is just the beginning. Every one of these flights is a step closer to a fully operational Starship that will take us beyond Earth orbit. And with our pace of rapid iteration here, the Moon and Mars are not nearly as far in the future as you may think. In fact, we're planning to send Starships to Mars as soon as 2026 which is when the next Mars transfer window opens, which is under two years from now. Now you might be familiar with the Starlink logo, which you see there on your screen. It's an iconic representation of the Mars transfer orbit, also called the Hellman transfer orbit. This transfer window, or the time between, the time when Earth and Mars are closest to each other, opens every 26 months and is only open for about two to three months at a time for a vehicle with Starship's power. Lining up a launch to Mars is similar to how we launch to the International Space Station, where we timed the launches to match the station's orbit. If we didn't do this, we would need more propellant and more time to get there. So the first opportunity we have to fly Starships to Mars, we plan to go for it. These first flight tests to Mars will be uncrewed and will test the reliability of landing in tech. If those landings go well, the first crewed flights will soon follow after that. Right now, our flight tests are focused on proving out reusability of both Super Heavy and Starship. In 2025, we'll continue that focus while also potentially flying our first Starlink missions and demonstrate capabilities central to our role in taking astronauts to the moon as part of NASA's Artemis program. Starship will be used to land astronauts on the lunar surface on NASA's Artemis III mission, which will put the first humans on the moon since 1972. One key capability will be the ability to refuel Starship on orbit, which you can see there on your screen, with a Starship prop tanker docked with a fuel depot. Next year, we're planning to test this capability by, capability by launching two Starships and having them meet up to transfer tons of cryogenic propellants. Now, when the time comes to land on the moon, Starship will link up with NASA's Orion spacecraft in lunar orbit, where astronauts will transfer over for their descent. Now, once on the lunar surface, they'll ride the elevator down in their Axiom EMU spacesuits from Axiom Space and leave the first footprints on the moon in more than half a century, kickstarting humanity's mission to establish a sustainable presence there. And coming soon to a moon base alpha near you, Starship Enterprise Edition. That is so exciting. <laughs> and all the advancements that are gonna come in order to enable all of that. Now, our rapid iterative development approach has been the basis for all of SpaceX's major innovative advancements, including Falcon, Dragon, and Starlink. Today, we're testing hardware and systems, and we need to know how they perform under the most extreme conditions. And what's more extreme than the flight environment? <laughs> We'd much rather find the bugs and limits now during testing than later on when there's more on the line. And to reiterate, while we do determine a acceptable of an acceptable level of technical risk on our vehicle and pad to learn as fast as possible, we accept no compromises when it comes to the safety of the public or our team. 
So all that to say, this is only the sixth of many future flight tests of Starship before it becomes fully operational. And we tend to do our testing out in the open, just like today. And that means people sometimes see when our hardware doesn't perform as we planned during that testing. And that's okay, because this is exactly what we are testing for, to physically see if hardware performance matches what we expect it to do or not. Even more with today's test flight, where we're purposefully pushing the ship beyond its limits. Starship development is also being aided by Starlink space-based connectivity. You might remember the Starlink panels that are incorporated into Starship, and you can see them there on your screen, those rectangular panels on Starship's nose cone. Starlink brings us the epic views in space and on reentry, and also helps deliver us critical flight data engineers need to continue development. Yeah, Starlink continues to help us push the limits in space in the short term by providing great views and real-time data on our next few flights, particularly through re-entry, which spaceflight veterans know that that is historically a period of blackout for all communications within spaceflight. Outside of Starship, Starlink has helped people across the globe, particularly in rural and remote areas that have been underserved by traditional broadband internet. Yeah, and soon, Starship will deploy our next generation Starlink satellites, which will continue to increase our capability to connect even more people with high-speed internet all around the world and beyond. Now, as we continue to prepare for our next several flight tests, we recently performed a cryo-proof test of the Starship for Flight 7, our first operation with a vehicle debuting a number of major milestones. The ship has been stretched uh, to make room for larger propellant tanks, increasing, increasing the propellant capacity from 1,200 tons to 1,500 tons. The forward flaps also got a redesign. They have shrunk in size and they also shifted in location, and both of these things will help better protect them during entry heating while still providing control. There's also a wide range of upgrades that will make the vehicle more reliable, adding redundancy to and the ability to operate for longer durations in space. One unique aspect of a trip to Mars are the different conditions ship will see when entering the Martian atmosphere. Now, it's difficult to simulate Mars at Mars's atmosphere when re-entering on Earth, so we've been testing a variety of heat shield materials inside a specialized plasma jet chamber at the University of Illinois Urbana-Champaign, where we're able to more closely simulate Mars's 95% carbon dioxide atmosphere. Aside from looking awesome, this is important <laughs> testing. The intense heat of entry will cause the CO2 to break down into its base elements, exposing Starship to atomic oxygen, which increases surface heating and can cause materials to oxidize or start to break down. Spacecraft entering over Mars encountered more than twice the amount of atomic oxygen at their peak when compared to Earth, and that is certainly a unique challenge. As we continue to test, we'll learn more about what makes a great heat shield for Mars. All right, now that we're heading into the final minutes of the countdown, let's go back to Dan for the latest on the ground there at Starbase. Hey, Kate, uh, afraid I have nothing but good news for you. We have a go from our range safety team. Uh, we are a little over 90% full on ship, uh, almost 85% full on booster. Uh, and not tracking any holds to an on-time liftoff. So we've got about three more minutes of prop load. As long as the range stays clear, we don't trip any other holds. We might blow right past that T-minus 40-second mark and lift off right at the top of our window at 4 p.m. Central. So toss it back to you guys one more time. But fun part about to start, we are, what, a little under six minutes away from launch. All right, so we are continuing to progress now at five minutes and 43 seconds until liftoff. Now, once we pass the T minus 40 second mark, a number of events are going to occur in rapid succession. The ground spin and ignition systems will come up to flight pressure and the ship will go on to internal power. And then after that, the quick disconnect or what we call the QD arm lockout is removed in preparation for retraction shortly after T zero. And once we pass the T minus 40 second mark, we still have the ability to recycle the count under certain conditions back to T minus 40 seconds and then hold there to assess what happened and if we can proceed again to T zero. Exactly. However, once the water for the deflector system begins flowing at T minus 10 seconds, any issue after that would be an automatic scrub for the day as the teams would need to refill the deflector's water tanks as well as the propellant storage tanks over at the tank farm before we're able to make another attempt. 
Now it is just so unbelievable that it's just been only a little over a month and we are just a few minutes away from flight six. Uh, the crowd here is building up. We've got a much larger crowd here than when we were uh, launching at four or five in the morning yep. <laughs> out here. So very excited to have an afternoon, afternoon launch to have all the employees here. Exactly. Now, just as a reminder, uh, that T minus 40 second uh, hold, if we uh, opt to use it, everything is still potentially go for launch. So nothing to be worried about there. Uh, at that point, basically up until T minus 40 seconds, all aborts are just holds. Uh, this would allow the team to wait for final checkouts to assess propellant levels, engines, avionics, vehicle pressurization, you know, range, weather. Occasionally we've had shrimp boats lingering in the past, <laughs> uh, but that doesn't sound like that is the case today. Yeah, not today, no shrimp boats, which is great. Everything so far is looking good. We're getting really excited here, just a few minutes away. We're gonna go back, uh, send it over to Dan in Starbase. Uh, how's it going, Dan? It is still going great. Just coming up on about three and a half minutes away. So we should be done with our prop load on ship momentarily. Then about 30 seconds later, we'll close out on booster. Uh, our flight control team on board or in the building just behind me, not on board. Some of them might wish they were on board. Flight control team in the building behind me, they're going to have a lot of work to do right after we lift off uh, as we still have a lot of manual checks that happen on the tower prior to the flight director, who's going to be Tristan Pierce again today, giving a manual command to bring the booster back to the launch site. And we had, the tower did just incredibly well on the last flight. We didn't lose any of our required redundancy for a catch. And so we're hoping to see that again today. Uh, a lot of the team, you know, really putting armor on the tower, making all of those things work, uh, played a huge role in making that catch possible and looking forward to hopefully seeing that happen again. Uh, and of course, sending our first payload to space. You can see the banana. It's very tightly secured, but I assure you it does have some room to float around. So once we're in a zero gravity environment, we should see our first Starship Zero Gravity indicator putting on a little bit of a show. Uh, and that's looking right in. That's where we're going to have Starlink. That's our PEZ deployer. Um, so getting its ride to space. So coming up on about two and a half minutes, we are closing out on all of our prop load. Uh, yep, just heard that our fill drains are starting to close. So that means we're no longer going to be flowing propellant into the booster and the ship. We're going to do what's called pushbacks. So all of that propellant in the ground systems is going to get pushed back to the tanks, clear out everything around the pad uh, right before we light those 33 engines and take off. Uh, just quick reminder, you're going to see fire start at the bottom. You're going to see the deflector start at about 10 seconds before launch. Lots of water to help dissipate all that heat, all that sound. And then the engine starting up in three different groups. And then about a second after T0, we should see liftoff. Uh, about two and a half minutes into the flight, a little bit longer, we'll see hot staging. And that's when we're going to be listening really close on those loops to see if we're going to be bringing the booster back for a catch today. Do always want to caution, it's never a guarantee. We've done this once. We'll see if we do it again. We're only going to do it if the booster and the tower are looking really good uh, before we attempt to bring it back here. But coming up on a minute, not tracking any holds on the board right now. So as long as we don't have any last second things, which do happen. All right, flight director just confirmed T minus one minute. Key moment to look at in 10 seconds, that T minus 40. And we flew right through that. Flight directors go for launch. All right, we're now T minus 20 seconds until liftoff of Starship Flight 6. This will mark our second attempt to catch the super heavy booster at the launch tower, as well as. 10, 9, 8, 7, 6, 5. Four, three, two, one. Four, three, two, one. 
vehicle is pitching down range. Booster Raptor, team pressure nominal. Booster and ship, avionics, power, and telemetry nominal. A little over a minute Maximum into the flight. Dynamic pressure. We're about six miles away, so all the sound's still hitting us here. Hearing good call outs that power telemetry nominal that's flying straight and true. We do see all 33 Raptor engines lit up on telemetry screens. At this point, we've passed through that point of maximum aerodynamic pressure, that max Q. Now, coming up in just a little over a minute from now is going to be hot staging. So we're going to see the six engines on the ship ignite while still attached to the booster. Just before that, we'll see all but three center engines on the booster shut down. And what we call Miko, it's most engines cut off instead of main engine. And so while we continue to watch it go up, a lot of our flight controllers looking at all the systems around the tower. Again, we have to send a manual command. Just about 30 seconds away from hot staging. And we heard, we heard the tower is go for catch. Booster engine cut off. The return flag is set for true. Ship engine start up. Stage separation. All right, hot staging confirmed. Booster six out of six out. lit on the ship. Booster boost back going. We heard that we are go for catch. Kate, Jesse, take out the views. Hopefully I got a booster. Coming home real soon. Wow, from our view here, Dan, uh, great views of planet Earth behind that super heavy booster. Right now it is performing the Ship boost back burn. Phenomenal. Good news there, telling us that the uh, the pressures inside the ship are good. That is the second stage or the upper portion of the vehicle. Follow along with the telemetry on the bottom of your screen. Yeah, booster is currently, a super heavy is currently in its boost back burn, this boost back burn. Avionics power telemetry nominal. This boost back burn lasts just a little bit over a minute, so we've got a little, uh, approximately 30 seconds left. We've had shutdown of that boost back burn. Up next will be hot stage jettison. The view from the camera on the left, or from the booster on the left hand side of your screen, and then tracking cam there on the right hand side of your screen. We'll see those grid fins. Booster offshore divert. And we can also see that the uh, hot stage has been jettisoned. Yes, visual confirmation of that there on your screen, which is great. Now the next- Starship is following a nominal trajectory. The next step for booster is going into that landing burn. Again, it'll light up 13 of those engines and then uh, pair down to three engines right before booster catch. All right, now just real quick, we did hear the call out, uh, boost back, or excuse me, booster offshore divert. Unfortunately, that means that we are no go for the catch. Um, as we said before, both the tower and the vehicle, as well as the operators on console have been actively evaluating the commit criteria for that return to the launch tower. Um, and unfortunately, we did not have a pass on those commit criteria. So we are no-go for tower catch. And we did mention that we're constantly evaluating the criteria for catch. There's a lot of things that need to go well in order to line that up. Unfortunately, today yep. we will forego booster catch today. But what you're seeing on your screen is ship uh, currently making its way towards the Indian Ocean, still looking good so far. Exactly. So views there of the booster on the left-hand side of your screen, views of the ship on the right-hand side of your screen. 
Now, we said before that it was not guaranteed that we would be able to make a, uh, a tower catch today. So while we were hoping for it, like we said, it was pretty epic on attempt one, but uh, the safety of the teams and the public and, uh, and, and the pad itself are uh, paramount. So we are accepting no compromises in any of those areas. Exactly, and we're still going to get a lot of good flight data with booster even, but especially with ship. Again, we have an additional objective today to do an in-space relight of a Raptor engine, which again will help us set us up for uh, being able to do deorbit burns, which is ship chamber pressure phenomenal. Which, yeah. which is important for orbital flights. And what you're seeing on your screen is a view from Super Heavy as it's making its way back down to Earth. Yeah, once again, we are attempting an offshore landing of the Super Heavy booster. Uh, so we have seen this before, uh, and it is still very fun <laughs> to watch, watching it come down uh, for a soft splashdown uh, off the Gulf Coast of Texas. We can see it there re-entering. Uh, we saw earlier those grid fins. There are four hypersonic grid fins. Oh, we can see that the landing burn has begun on the Super Heavy booster. And same pattern, 13 engines will light. Gone down to three, just as we expected. And what an incredible view of splashdown that we got today. Oh, super heavy. Down? Yeah, I'm sure the buoy cam views will be <laughs> pretty awesome once again. So we'd like to confirm a water landing once again for the super heavy booster. Congrats to the SpaceX team uh, for making that milestone as well. Now, ship continues to look good. We can see uh, that it is, while all of that was happening, <laughs> the crowd here in Hawthorne uh, continuing to react to all these amazing views that we're getting. The next milestone is... Starship uh, is in terminal guidance. Great news there. Uh, uh, Starship terminal guidance, referring to what we see here on our screen, the upper stage, uh, at uh, about eight minutes, 35 seconds or so, we have ship engine cutoff, which will be the cutoff of the, uh, the, the Raptor engines. We can see on our screen ship giving us some incredible views brought to us by Starlink. Uh, this view is also very interesting because we can see basically the receding tile line that we referred to earlier, where we mentioned we have removed a number of heat shield tiles in order to test out and push the envelope on the ship and demonstrate what its capabilities are. Ship engine cutoff. And there we just heard a call out for Seco ship engine cutoff. Great news there, everything continuing to look awesome for ship. Full view looking aft on ship here. Ship FTS is saved. Nominal orbit insertion. There's that call out we were waiting for. Confirmation of good orbital insertion for ship today. It has been a very exciting afternoon <laughs> so far. Uh, we'd like to send it back over to Dan, who can give us that uh, <laughs> live view experience. Dan, uh, once again, are you okay after witnessing <laughs> another Starship launch? Yeah, uh, totally fine. Uh, it's you guys have to be jealous. This is the only way to do this. This is fantastic. Uh, no, it was really cool to see a lift off. 33 out of 33. Uh, didn't go for the booster catch today. Initially, we were good, and then we tripped a, a commit criteria and did the offshore divert. So we went and did that water landing, as everybody saw. Uh, we'll dig into it a little bit more. Uh, but again, this is we've done it once. We've now done it twice. We're going to keep trying to do it as this is just a core capability of Starship and what's going to make it so incredible. Uh, there's a lot left. We're just about almost 10 minutes into this flight, uh, so about 50 plus minutes still to go. Ship nominal orbit, so it's on its way around the planet. It's going to attempt to do an in-space burn. We're going to light one of those Raptor engines, the sea level ones in the middle, uh, just to help demonstrate that we can relight in that microgravity environment. Really critical for deorbit orbit burns uh, as we start to do some orbital missions uh, in the not too distant future. Um, and then following that, we'll see a ship entry 
maybe a splashdown. As you guys said, we're, we're really going to be pushing ship on this one. Uh, we're pretty much intentionally putting it in places where we expect it might not do so great. And all that's to try and help us learn, see if we were a little too conservative. And then maybe that opens up more capability for when we start catching them. But uh, I'll check back in with everybody in a little bit. Uh, I'm going to tune in and watch the ship fly around planet Earth. Uh, and hopefully we see it re-entering in the not too distant future. Back over to you guys. Thanks, Dan. Development testing, by definition, is unpredictable, which we saw with super heavy splashing down in the Gulf of Mexico today, but that is exactly why we test. As is standard for these tests, the area around the pad and along the flight path was cleared prior to launch, and we expect the road and beach to, be, to remain closed until further notice. Yeah, testing development flight hardware in a flight environment is what enables our teams to quickly learn and execute design changes and hardware upgrades to improve the probability of success in the future. Please do not attempt to approach the booster in the water for your safety as well as for that of our team that will be working on recovery. Now, uh, we are going to continue though. The mission is not done. <laughs> exactly, the mission's not over, ship is still coasting. But it has been nonstop since liftoff and with the booster having completed its job for the day, we are going to take a short break for the next 35 minutes or so while ship continues to coast before re-entry. Now, as with previous flights, Starlink may enable us to talk to the ship through re-entry with no communication blackout. Now, we, still, we are still testing Starlink during this phase of flight, so nothing is completely certain. Yeah, so if we do have views, we will be sure to bring those to you live. And of course, one of those views include that of our, as we said before, surprise payload, the banana. Uh, and we are looking forward to it. So um, we're going to come back in a few minutes, around T plus 35 minutes. Exactly. Views or no views, we'll see you back here at T plus 40 minutes for our coverage of Starship's reentry, flip maneuver, landing burn, and hopefully see a splashdown.
are just about 35 minutes into today's flight test, continuing to get some live views from Starship itself as it continues to make its way around the globe. Uh, we are coming up on what we will hopefully see uh, is our in-space relight demonstration. This will be firing up one of those uh, three sea level raptors on the very aft end of the ship um, and essentially reigniting it uh, while we're in that microgravity environment in Earth orbit. Uh, we had attempted this once previously on flight three, but ended up skipping it when we had some attitude control issues uh, with the ship. And we are on the dark side of the planet right now, so the views are gonna be a little bit dark, uh, but hopefully we see some engine light uh, come on as we do this relight test. This is a, a pretty critical capability for doing deorbit burns. This is not a deorbit burn. Want to stress that we're on a trajectory where if we didn't fire off the engine at all, we are definitely coming home. Ooh, seeing some some uh, some thunderstorms down on the ground. That's pretty cool. Uh, but this is not a deorbit burn. If we didn't fire this engine, we're on a intentional suborbital trajectory. Um, so no matter what, we're coming in over the Indian Ocean. Firing off the engine does change your exact splashdown point a little bit but we've got this keep out zone across the entire Indian Ocean that we made sure was clear ahead of flight uh, and we continue to monitor during, but we're, we're gonna aim for that and hopefully see this relay test coming on in about a minute. It's just gonna be one of these engines uh, and it uses what's called the header tank. So these small spherical tanks in the very top of Starship up in the nose cone, uh, they're, they don't require nearly as much gas to, to pressurize as your main tank, so they're really useful for uh, any uh, in-orbit maneuvers, um, and then for landing burns. So if we make it to a landing burn today, we'll be using them uh, for that as well. Uh, so we should be coming up in just about the next minute, should be under a minute now, away from that expected ship burn. And again, these this is, we've relit Raptors pretty frequently. Uh, we just did it with the landing burn uh, and that boost back burn on the booster. And we've done it on ship landing burns. Uh, we just haven't done it in this microgravity environment where your propellant management and a lot of other things are different uh, as you're not really down with the force up. of Earth's gravity. And just heard up. the call out for startup. There's some light. There's that Raptor relit and shut down. All right, there you have it. The first time ever lighting a Raptor while in outer space, other than our ascent burn. Um, so really cool to see that relit. That's, that's a pretty critical capability that we're going to need uh, when we're doing orbital missions in the not too distant future. Uh, so check another one off. Uh, that was That was a really cool... Uh, that was an objective we really wanted to hit on this one, and so good to see ship uh, knock that one out in orbit. Uh, but for now, we're going to coast for just a little bit longer, and then it'll be time for ship entry. So we'll get the usual light show um, as we return Our from hypersonic velocities. Uh, we're just starting to do the entry prep for that, so we're going to get the flaps positioned, uh, and then it's going to start taking the brunt of, of all of that heat as you're coming in from... Uh, well well in excess of 10,000 miles an hour. Uh, that's all going to build up a lot of heat as you're encountering an increasing atmosphere, building up that friction. And we're going to see how the tiles fare. We've also got uh, some pretty cool tile experiments that we'll talk about in a little bit. But uh, coming up real soon, ship re-entry, re successful relight, uh, and we'll start this entry part soon.
Starship is at 100 kilometers altitude. Good attitude for atmospheric entry. Welcome back to Starship's sixth test flight. It has been an exciting day so far. We lifted off from Starbase at 4 p.m. Central Time. The Super Heavy booster and ship had a successful separation as well as a good boost back burn and good separation of the hot stage adapter. We did not attempt a return to the launch site and catch attempt today when strict criteria were not met and the Super Heavy booster executed a planned divert to a landing burn and soft splashdown in the Gulf of Mexico. Yeah, obviously we were hoping to come back to the tower, but uh, this was a test and we knew that it was a very viable possibility. Starship is at 85 kilometers. Flaps now have control of the vehicle. All right, great news there, turning our attention over to the star of the show here, giving us these amazing views once again. Uh, we heard the call out there telling us that the Starship vehicle is now 83 kilometers above. Coming up around T plus, uh, well, now actually, the ship, as you can see, is beginning to re-enter the Earth's atmosphere. As a reminder, one of the main goals of today's flight test is for the ship to make it through the extreme heat of re-entry and to do so in a controlled manner. Now, re-entry is typically a portion of flight where we don't have communication capability with the spacecraft because it's re-entering at or around orbital velocity, which is roughly eight kilometers per second or about five miles per second. Now at those speeds, yep, pretty fast, uh, <laughs> the spacecraft is moving through the atmosphere uh, rather quickly and that results in friction as we can see that starting to happen on our screen and this creates a plasma field around the vehicle. That blanket of plasma distorts communication frequencies, so it's not uncommon to experience brief blackouts in communication. Starship is approaching the peak heating phase of entry. And we just heard we're getting into the, the peak heating phase. We're getting these views courtesy of Starlink. We've got four uh, different terminals on the ship itself. It's what's really allowed us to get real-time data during what's otherwise been just a, 
a mystery box essentially for spacecraft design where you, when you're re-entering through the atmosphere, uh, at least getting anything in real time uh, hasn't ever been possible before, but we're able to not just get these views, but real-time telemetry from the ship as it's coming through. Um, do really want to stress that we are, we are really pushing the ship today. Uh, the heat shield is not in the same configuration as it was last flight, where we had a team of ship techs do just an otherworldly task, replacing the entire heat shield, thousands of tiles, installing a backup ablative, and that pretty much set us up to do a, a pinpoint landing on flight five. We did not do that with this one. We have some backup in those really sensitive areas around the flap. Uh, but this is an older generation heat shield. And knowing we weren't going to do that, we even went and removed some extra tiles. There are some missing tiles on the nose cone where we're testing some backups. There are some steel covered tiles in a couple of different spots. Uh, and there's also a whole lot more steel of the ship showing. Um, as you guys talked about, we gave it a little bit of a haircut, uh, a couple hundred tiles uh, trimmed off the sides. And that's where we might have catch fittings in the future, but who color color starting to come in? So it looks like uh, things are going to start heating up, Kate and Jesse. Yeah, fun fact, Dan. We actually removed 2,100 heat shield tiles from Starship in order to uh, basically present that necessary receding line, which you kind of can see there in your view. Um, think back to previous flights. The, the heat shield line came up further on the vehicle. And just like Dan said, we want to test the vehicle beyond what we think it is capable of carrying based on our simulations and calculations. Um, so once again, to just be super plain, don't be surprised if we see some wackadoodle stuff happen here. Um, <laughs> we won't be. Uh, there are a number of things that we are testing out intentionally to see what the ship can take. Yeah, exactly. And knowing what those limits are will, will, will really help us design the vehicle of the future. Um, essentially, removing those tiles helps us remove a lot of weight from the vehicle, a lot of things that might potentially need refurbishment in the future. Um, and the goal is to come up with a heat shield pattern or design that we don't have to refurbish. We can just continue to use it over and over again. And that's why we're changing some of those tiles and uh, moving stuff around, mo removing a lot of those tiles, um, as Kate has been mentioning. Exactly. And, you know, looking forward to the Starship capability of the future, we want to be able to catch Starship like we do with boosters. And so the next flight, uh, we want to better understand where we can install catch hardware, not necessarily to actually do the catch, but to see how that hardware holds up in those spots. And today's flight will help inform you know, does the stainless steel hold up like we think it may based on experiments that we conducted on flight five? Now, continuing to yeah. look, amazing views. Yeah, Dan, go ahead. Oh, I was just going to say, like, there's there's so much on this flight that we're doing to try and, you know, make all the ships that we're about to start flying even better, just really understand what their capabilities are going to be. We've got kind of the next gen ship lined up for flight seven it's got all of those heat shield upgrades and everything uh and one of the things that we're going to be doing that's that's most interesting and one of the reasons we wanted daylight is we're going to be flying pretty aggressively as ship comes in we're going to be kind of nose down and we've done it in wind tunnels we've done it in simulations you might see the flaps really flapping around trying to control the vehicle um we're we're betting we might have a little bit more capability than we think in just the analysis, but always a chance that bet doesn't pay off. Uh, but that just helps us know, like, what are what are our Starship limits? is now halfway through the peak heating phase of entry. Sweet, halfway there, halfway home, guys. Yeah, and if you guys, again, can follow along with the altitude and the speed of ship as it's making its way back down to Earth, bottom right-hand corner of your screen, um, speed is still going really, really fast. Again, as it gets closer to Earth, um, we'll see that altitude drop a little bit faster. It's kind of dropping pretty slow right now. Um, and again, as we get closer and closer to literally the surface of the water, then we'll start to see that speed pick up. Um, and if we can make it through this re-entry, 
uh, we will attempt to do that flip maneuver once again uh, and splash down in the ocean. Exactly. Um, like we've been saying, we are testing beyond the perceived limits of the vehicle. Um, we want to go learn more about the ship, and this is a great opportunity to do that. So really pushing the flight hardware in a flight environment uh, to help inform these future designs. Um, as we've mentioned, it has a different heat shield. This heat shield is uh, a uh, not the same generation as what we flew last time. This one is one generation older. So uh, we are also testing out new secondary thermal protection uh, materials. So basically, like if the heat shield isn't in this one spot, can this other material protect the metal is the thinking there. Uh, also checking of the ship's structural strength in those areas where we're looking to add that ship catch hardware just to see if it survives entry. So yeah, as we've been saying, we've, we've done um, a lot of calculations and simulations. This view right here is super cool. This is looking out from the aft engine bay, basically at the bottom of Starship. Um, then on the center left hand panel, if you will, we have one of the forward Starship flats, flaps, so one of the flaps located at the top of the vehicle. Underneath that is one of the aft end flaps, like the one that we see in the main picture there on the right hand side of your screen. Now these views as the vehicle continues to enter the Earth's atmosphere, drawing a crowd once again here at SpaceX and Hawthorne as folks tune in as the mission continues on. Now the next event that we have coming up, uh, we should hear the call out that the vehicle is transonic around T plus one hour and two minutes or so. That means that the vehicle is traveling near the speed of sound. We, we say near the speed of sound because there are certain parts of the vehicle where airflow is going faster and other parts where it's going slower. So it kind of teeters there on the brink of, of the speed of sound. So um, once we have equal flow on all parts, then we'll hear it's subsonic. Yeah, and I- Oh, and almost real quick, almost a reverse of, I'm sorry, Jesse, almost a reverse of before we see the earth starting to come into view. We've got we've got sunrise there, over over the Indian Ocean. So this is this is going to look different from any of the ranchers we've had before, and it was specifically so like we we get as much daylight as possible to see how ship does this. Over to you, Jesse. Sorry about that. Dan, you great minds think alike. That's exactly what I was going to point out: is that we're getting a lot clearer view of the Earth in the background with uh, the different temperatures that we're seeing with the different colors um, of that plasma around the ship, which is really, really cool to see. Again, um, we are pushing the limits of ship today, um, but so far everything is looking pretty nominal. Um, yeah. We'll see how the next few minutes goes. Yeah, <laughs> like we've said before, don't be surprised if this is not entirely smooth sailing <laughs> all the way down to the ocean surface. Similar to Flight 5, we are targeting the same splashdown location in the Indian Ocean, but we are not expecting to recover the vehicle. Right, and we were getting some glimpses of the flaps. The flaps so far are looking pretty good. We're not seeing any burn through. There's those flaps again um, in that hinge area, which is our most concerning area there. Um, that's great news for us for now. Again, the next few minutes could change as we continuously push those limits. Yeah, once once we slow down a little bit, once we're subsonic essentially, so I think that's about 1,200 kilometers an hour. Uh, once we're down below that, that's that's when we're going to kind of dip our nose down and and get that more aggressive angle of attack. Normally, we're just belly flop right into the water, pretty much that position. Uh, but if we're going to be able to do return to launch sites. Uh, we're going to want to be able to fly with a little bit more of an angle of attack, get you a little bit more range as you're coming through. And so this will this will be just a test to see quite how far can we push it. And obviously, we're going to do these kind of tests way out here in super remote areas before you ever try to bring a ship back to a place like Starbase. Starship remains on a good entry trajectory. External temperatures are coming down. All right, great news there. That tells us that we are through the phase of peak heating. So we are expecting 
the, uh, the, these temperatures to continue to come down. Once again, we are targeting a soft splashdown in the Indian Ocean uh, around the, off the northwest coast of, of Australia. We can see these beautiful views of planet Earth coming in. Yeah, this is very different where we had nighttime mm -hmm. views of the ship as it was re-entering. And now we've got daylight. It is about an hour or so after sunrise there in the Indian Ocean. So pretty cool to see this. Yeah, and it might not seem like it makes a huge difference, but we do get a little bit more light on ship as well for the camera views that we have, um, which is very beneficial for us to visually see anything and try and correlate that to any of the sensors or data that we have on the vehicle. Exactly. That is why we shifted our launch window so that we could have the daylight in order to improve our observations of the vehicle. So not only are we getting all the raw data from all the sensors that are on board Starship, but we also have multiple cameras and assets out there that are watching the vehicle and will also be able to tell us with this visual story that is also very, very important. And as we get down a little bit lower, the Raptor engines are in their chill phase right now. So just essentially getting them primed to turn on. We're, we're gonna use th those three center engines uh, to do a landing flip and then a landing burn. So we'll come down kind of in that slightly pointed down belly flop and then fire off those engines to flip us around and then do that final landing burn. That should be coming up in just a little over, just under five minutes from now. Uh, and then hopefully we start hearing some, some call outs on transonic and subsonic as we slow down. Again, once, once you hear Starship as subsonic, keep a close eye on the flaps. They, they're, gonna be, they're gonna be working over time essentially uh, to maintain control of the ship as we, as we get a little more aggressive with this. We can see that we are beginning. Starship has passed maximum entry dynamic pressure. All right, great call out there. But we can see on this view here that we do have some heating there on that looks like one of the forward flaps on Starship. This is to be expected. We knew that the vehicle uh, would perform differently than what we had seen on Flight 5. This is actually really good data because it tells us what parts of the vehicle at this, you know, what will soon be a higher angle of attack once we drop down uh, below the speed of sound. We'll have a higher angle of attack, meaning we're gonna be flying nose down, basically. Um, so yeah, this is good news, but we can actually, it looks like that heating is starting to cool off there. Yeah, it's a little burn through. Um, again, it is important to note when we start seeing that um, through the ship's descent as well. So like Kate was saying, it, we're getting some really good data here. Um, it looks like uh, the other flaps are doing a little better than the one that has a little burn through, which is some good news. Uh, again, constantly watching. We've got a couple minutes until we're expecting uh, to make it all the way back down to Earth. Exactly. And like we said before, uh, we are not expecting to recover the ship, although that would be great. It would be a nice bonus if it happened, but it's not really in our expectations today. Um, we really want to push the hardware, as we've been saying. But really, the telemetry and the data and the video that we receive all the way to the end is truly what we're looking for and will help inform the future designs of this vehicle. We can see some flap movement as the camera is moving around. Um, that's what you're seeing there is the flaps adjusting. Um, and we have a camera on one of the flaps there that were, that this is the view that you're seeing there. And you can also see the graphic in the bottom. Starship um, is slowing down past Mark 1. And call outs aligning with this. You can see the orientation of the vehicle starting to change. You can follow that graphic at the bottom of your screen. Um, Again, that is why those flaps are changing. They control the orientation of the vehicle. Yeah, there are yeah, four. This is... Go ahead, Starship Dan. has started the subsonic belly flop. Gonna... Remains on a good trajectory. I was going to say this is this is when things will will start to get a little interesting. So this is when we're we're moving slower than the speed of sound. You can see that nose slowly start to tip down, uh, and we're going to try and maintain flap control the whole way. But we are just just a couple minutes away from hopefully doing a landing flip. 
uh, landing flip and landing burn if, if uh, the flaps can hold together. Yeah, this is such a cool view. This reminds me uh, of when we first performed the belly flop maneuver on the high altitude test with serial number eight. We saw the ship come back through and I always wondered what it looked like from the ship's perspective. And this perspective I think helps inform that. We will be, as Dan said, we will be dipping down a little further and really be flying nose first. Um, this higher angle of attack you know, we're intentionally doing it to stress those aft flaps, and that will help inform the limits of flap control in order to collect data for future landing profiles. I mean, we're looking, we're looking good so far. We've just got about five kilometers in altitude to go. We'll, we'll ignite the engines when we're still just a couple hundred meters uh, over the ground, do that flip. Starting and is landing passing through burn. five kilometers altitude, remains on a good trajectory. I have a feeling this is gonna look so cool as it passes through the clouds. Obligatory shout out to the entire avionics team on Starship. <laughs> and there's that nose down orientation. Now the uh, Raptor engines will relight and help flip the booster back up. This is a more severe flip given the orientation. Uh, the engines will shut down prior to the water making impact, and prior to the vehicle making impact with the water. Our ship is doing great so far. There's, There's those engines the relighting. What a great reorientation by Starship. Wow. All three down to two, into the water. Starship is landed. Wow. And we have ship splashed down in the Indian Ocean. <laughs> Some awesome buoy cam action here. Yes. Daylight news. Incredible. We really pushed the limits on shipping and made it all the way back down to Earth. I am shocked, to be <laughs> honest. I think many folks are. Uh, the fact that it survived all the way through <laughs> while flying a lesser gen heat shield is just absolutely incredible. And uh, turns out the vehicle had more capability than our calculations predicted. And that is why we test like we fly. Exactly why we do that. And those views were absolutely incredible to watch. Because of Starlink, we were able to get the views all the way down, yeah. as well as the buoys, uh, seeing ship touch down in daylight. So cool, so cool. <laughs> now we want to, unfortunately, wrap up the show. <laughs> yeah, exactly. We'll say congratulations to our teammates at SpaceX and to everyone who supported the Starship program. And thank you to all of our future customers for your support. We'd also like to thank the people of Cameron County, Texas, as well as the Coast Guard, the Federal Aviation Administration, the Government of Mexico, and the Australian Space Agency. Now, be sure to... Hey guys, I, I could take it from here. Uh, that was just incredible to see, to see that splash down. Uh, as you said, thanks to everybody that took such a huge part in this. Everybody here at Starbase that's worked on this program, just really pouring your lives into it. Uh, great to see another booster lift off. We'll catch it the next time. Great to sh see ship in the water. Uh, new version of ship coming soon. So a lot more exciting launches coming up real soon here from Starbase. Uh, but I'll send, I'll send us out this time. We'll see you guys next time. Awesome. Thanks, Dan. Be sure to follow SpaceX on X for updates and more exciting views that we weren't able to feature on today's broadcast. I'm sure there will be plenty of those. <laughs> now, thanks to all of you for tuning in, and we'll see you next time.